Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm nearing the end of my second week teaching on living in the balance of grace and faith. I tell you, this is something that has revolutionized my life. Until you get the grace of God combined with what you do and understand what's God's part and what's your part, until you get this understood and put it together in the right combination, I tell you, your life is going to be a mess. This is something that God showed me 40-something years ago. It's the very first book that I ever wrote. It's been expanded on, and uh, I'm even teaching some new things uh, during this teaching through it that I haven't taught in the past. But these are things that have been working in my life for a long time, and I really consider this to be some of the foundational things that God has shown me. And so because of that, I'm offering this book. It's a 200-plus page book, and I'm offering it to you as a free gift. We encourage people to give. I need people to give. If nobody gave, we would go broke doing this. But I've learned that when we give, God always gives back to us. And so if you can, help us find. But if you can't, we want you to have this book so much that I'll give it to you as a free gift. We'll give out all of that information at the end of the program. I've already covered so much material that I can't go back through it. I encourage you to please go back to our website. You can see the archive teachings on this. Please get the book. Please get the CDs, DVDs, or the USB and go through this. But I just haven't got time to go back through everything I've taught. This week, in the last couple of days, I've been going through Ephesians chapter 1 because the first three chapters of Ephesians talk about what God has already done. And I've been making a point out of every one of these verses in the first chapter it's talking about you're already blessed. You've already had God abound towards you with wisdom. You're already accepted in the beloved. You already have redemption. You already have all of these things. And then the last part of the first chapter is where he prays a prayer, not that God would give you something new or do something new or respond to you, but rather that your eyes would be opened to what he's already done that His inheritance is in you already and that you have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living in you. And I tell you, there's not very many Christians that have that attitude. I go to churches a lot and I've heard so many people pray and say, Oh God, just come down. Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. I've actually heard sermons preached on that. Did you know that that's a scripture from Isaiah? Rend the heavens and come down. And I've heard people pray that. And they say, well, it's in the Bible. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with it is God rent the heaven and He came down through Jesus. And through Jesus, He's already done everything. And by His grace, He's supplied everything before you even had the need. And for you to say, rent the heavens and come down, in a sense, it's like a slap in the face of Jesus, that Jesus isn't enough. I need something more than Jesus. Do something more. No, everything you will ever need is in Jesus. You've got more in Jesus than any of us will ever tap into. We don't need God to rend the heavens. We need, like it says right here, for our eyes to be opened to what we already have. And it's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. There isn't any more power. I heard Kenneth Copeland say this one time that he was just praying and saying, God, I want more power, more power. And he was begging God for more power. And he said, God stopped him right in the middle of his prayer. And he says, Kenneth, where am I going to go get any more power? I've already given you the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. God doesn't have any more power. You have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Of his fullness have all we received. John chapter 1, verse 16. You've got the fullness of the Godhead living in you bodily. You've got the same power that raised Christ from the dead. You can't get any more power. Now, you can manifest more power. You can renew your mind and learn how to believe and get rid of the unbelief, and you can start releasing more of the power of God, but you can't get any more power of God. God's grace is complete. God didn't just save you a little bit, enough to get you saved and stuck so that you can hold on. And then when you go to heaven, somehow that's, that's when your salvation is really going to take place. Right now on the inside of you, in your spirit, your spirit is the exact same spirit 
right this moment that it will be a million years from now in eternity. You have the fullness of God's power living on the inside of you, but you need to learn how to get it out through your mind, through your emotions. I tell you, most of our mind and emotions are huge hindrances to God's power flowing through us. We're thinking incorrectly. And part of the thinking incorrectly is that, oh God, you have power, but I don't have any. Just give me more power. You're denying what it says right here. He's praying that your eyes would be open to what you already have, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. You have raising from the dead power on the inside of you. You don't need more power. You need more understanding of how what you've got and how to release it. Philemon chapter 1 verse 6 says that the communication of your faith becomes effectual by acknowledging every good thing that is in you in Christ. If your faith isn't effectual, it's because you aren't acknowledging. You don't fully know what you've got. And then you turn over to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 and it says, All things that pertain unto life and godliness are given unto us through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. All things that pertain unto life and godliness. You know, that's healing pertains unto life and godliness. Prosperity, joy, peace, wisdom, understanding. Anything that you need comes through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, the next verse goes on to say, "...whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature." having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So his knowledge gave us these exceeding great and precious promises. You've already got everything that you need on the inside, but it's released through knowledge. This is the reason that I've been on television now for 23 years preaching the truth. I was on radio before that for 25 years. For the last 55 years, I have been proclaiming and teaching things. And as knowledge comes to people, if they will receive it and begin to acknowledge the good things that God has placed on the inside of them, I have seen tens of thousands, hundreds, maybe millions of people's lives have been changed because they've heard truth. And it didn't make something, it didn't make God do something. God had already done it, but it allowed them to start receiving what God had already done. Man, that is just phenomenal. And so I've already covered the first chapter of Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just continue. Like I said, the first three chapters are just trying to get you to see what you already have, what God has already done. It's not trying to get you to get anything new. It's just trying to open up your eyes to what grace has already provided and then you believe it and knowledge, that knowledge causes your faith to abound. And now if you'll put your faith in what God has already done by grace, you'll begin to start seeing that power released. So he goes on to say in chapter two, and you hath he quickened. The word quickened here means made alive. And notice it says he hath quickened. It didn't say in you can he quicken, will he quicken if you'll do certain things. No, again, this is all written from the standpoint of it's a done deal. Jesus has already provided everything. You don't need God to heal you, deliver you, prosper you, anything. God's done His part. He needs you to believe and learn how to release what He's already done. So He's praying and He says, And you hath He quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Notice that hath He quickened, that's something that took place in the past. You were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also you, we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others." Boy, there's a lot in those verses. That is completely contrary to what most people think today, but let me move on. It goes on to say in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. The word quickened means make alive. When we were dead in sins, 
Boy, this is such a great illustration right here. Again, most Christians believe that we have to pray, go to church, pay our tithes, study the Word, do this, this, and this, and then, if we do it right, God will do His part and respond to us. But notice, it says that He hath quickened us when we were dead in trespasses and sins. The word quickens make the life. He made us alive. He resurrected us. We got born again, not when we were at our best, but when we were at our worst. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners. You hadn't been fasting and praying and going to church and paying your tithes and reading the Bible and loving your mate and doing everything just right. You were an absolute mess. Now, some of you may think, Oh, not me. I, I really was a good person. Well, I'm not sure you got born again if you think that Jesus just made up a little bit of the difference. You have to come to the end of yourself and realize that you're a sinner. Jesus gave Himself for the ungodly is what it says in Romans chapter 4. He died for the ungodly. And unless you're willing to admit that you're ungodly, you can't receive salvation. You have to come to the end of yourself before you receive the salvation that comes from God. And so the truth is, you were a sinner. God commended His love towards you in that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. You didn't have all of this goodness to your name, and yet you received the greatest miracle that you could ever receive, which is the forgiveness of sins and your salvation. And you received it when your faith was puny. You hadn't been, a, you know, seeking the Lord for decades and growing and maturing in the Lord. You were a rank sinner. Some of you are out living in adultery and getting drunk and doing dope and anger and your own self and on and on it goes. You weren't doing anything, and yet you received the greatest miracle that you could ever receive, which is salvation. And then it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, the Apostle Paul said, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. That means that if you receive the greatest gift of all, salvation, when you didn't have any goodness to your name, you hadn't been going to church and paying your tithes, you just received it as a gift. If that's the way you receive salvation, then that's the way you're supposed to continue to walk in salvation. If the way you receive salvation was by singing, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. And if you receive salvation as a free gift, then why do you feel like you have to earn healing? Why do you feel like you have to earn prosperity? See, you, you aren't walking by the same rule. We come to God totally by putting faith in what Jesus did for us. We put faith in grace. You know, I've had people come forward in my services, and I've seen thousands of people get born again. And there's times that God shows me things about people. Let's just suppose that somebody came forward for salvation and God showed me they're living in adultery. And if I was to say, you're living in adultery, did you know if they truly understood that you're saved by grace through faith, not based on your goodness, but it's the grace of God He's already provided, and all you have to do is believe and receive. If they truly understood that, and if I pointed out that they were living in adultery, did you know that wouldn't keep them from getting saved? They would say, that's the reason I'm coming to Jesus, and I'm receiving this gift of salvation is because I am not worthy. I can't save myself, but Jesus paid for me, so I'll receive it as a gift. If they truly understood grace and faith, they, they would go ahead and get saved. But let that person get saved and go to the average church, and the average church will tell them, oh, yeah, you got saved by putting faith in what Jesus did. But now that you've been born again, you got to start living holy. And if you don't do these things, if you don't come to church, if you don't pay your tithes, and they'll give you a list of things, that's the reason God won't heal you. God's not going to heal you. God's not going to answer your prayers until you get this straightened out. See, that's contrary. You got saved by putting faith in what Jesus did, but now that you go to church, now you got to start doing things, and God isn't going to respond until you do certain things. He's responding to your faith. That's the way it's taught. That's inconsistent. And that's the reason that so many people, they'll have this honeymoon experience, 
where they get born again and they just are so excited about Jesus because here they were a total wreck and they realize that I'm going to hell without Jesus. And then they hear this good news that Jesus loved us so much that he doesn't want us to go to hell. He took our sins. He paid for us. And it's not based on any goodness of their own. It's just a gift. And so they believe and they receive and they get so excited. They're just on a honeymoon. I've had people describe it as all of the colors became brighter. The, bl the sky was bluer. The grass was greener. That everything, it was just awesome. They are on this honeymoon period. But then they go to church. And after a short period of time, it seems like this newness, this excitement, the joy and the peace that they had when they first got born again begins to wear off. And there's actually churches that preach that you go through this honeymoon period, but then God starts putting you through the valley. He starts putting sickness and poverty and things on you to humble you, to break you, to make you better. And they will actually, uh, by observation, they can see that most people have this excitement at first and then it begins to wane. And they actually put their stamp of approval on it saying that this is the way God intended it to be. No, that's not so. You know what's happened? When you got born again, it was just told you that it was totally grace. You don't deserve it. And so you just believe and receive or doubt and do without. So you believe, you receive, and all of a sudden you're just thrilled with Jesus. But then you go to church and they start telling you, oh yeah, you got saved by grace, but now you are maintained by performance. You got to live right and do right or God won't answer your prayer. And that's the reason that you lose your joy is because you have moved away from grace and you've started putting faith in your faith, in your actions. You know, there's a track that um, was very popular back when I first got saved and I pass these tracks out all of the time. It was the Four Spiritual Laws and it was put out by Campus Crusade for Christ and it was accurate. I'm not criticizing the track, but part of the track is on one page, they had this mountain over here and here was God on this mountain and then here's another mountain over here, and that's you. And they showed that every attempt of you trying to bridge this gap and make it over to God, you fell short. And it showed people just falling in this gap, and nobody can reach God based on your own goodness. And so here's God over here. Here you are, and there's such a gap between you that nothing you can do could ever earn you right standing with God. But then you flip the page, and here's that same God on one mountain and you on another, but now there's this huge cross that spans the gap. And through the cross, you can now enter over here and have relationship with God. And that's good. I'm not criticizing that. But what they didn't say and what I'm trying to depict is that a lot of people get these truths. They come to the Lord. They get born again. They come over here through Jesus and have relationship with God. But then when they go to church and they start saying, oh yeah, you got saved by grace. It was through the cross. It was through what Jesus did that you have a relationship with God. But now if you want to get healed, if you want to be prospered, if you want to get your prayers answered, well, then you got to start doing right. You got to do this unless you do these things. God won't bless you. What they do, they just erase the cross. And now you're born again. Maybe you won't go to hell, but you're over here again. And now it's all up to you and everything you do falls short. See, that's not the way that it is. You not only got saved by grace, but you have to be maintained by grace. You know, I've actually had people in churches before that were seeking for the Lord to heal them or prosper them or something like that, and they doing everything they know how to do, and yet they aren't seeing the healing, the prosperity manifest. And then some drunk comes in off the street or some person that's, you know, all tattooed up and isn't doing anything right. They're, they're against everything that the strict, straight-laced religion is preaching against. And they come in and just receive Jesus and instantly get healed, get delivered, get prospered, and they begin to prosper. And instead of dear old Saint so-and-so rejoicing with them, their thought is, why did God do it for them and didn't do it for me? And then they'll point to the fact that, man, I make pies for people. When people have tragedy, I go over and help them. I'm at the church every time the doors are open. I'm doing this, this, this. How come God did it for them? And they don't have any religious works for their credit. And here I've been serving the Lord for 20 years and 
I haven't seen the healing power of God. You know why? Because that dear old rank sinner over here, they just heard the good news and they believed and they put faith in Jesus. This dear old saint over here is putting faith in themselves, and they may be doing the right things, studying the Word and helping other people in need, but they're doing it trying to earn God's favor. That won't work. That's not what the Bible calls faith. That's works. That's legalism. You have to put faith in what Jesus did for you. And that's what this is saying, that you were sinners by nature. You were all of these things, but God hath quickened us, made us come alive. It's already happened. God has done it. You are alive. Your spirit is as alive to God as it can possibly get. And going back to the prayer in the first chapter, you've already got the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. You don't need more power. You don't need more love. You don't need more faith. You don't need more victory. You don't need more anointing. I've been in services before where they have a double portion night and they will turn over and read about how that Elisha got a double portion of the spirit that was on Elijah. And so they'll say, you come up here and we're going to pray and you're going to get twice the anointing. Did you know that worked for Elisha because they only had the spirit of God on them in, in a portion. They didn't have the fullness of the spirit of God. But every New Testament believer in your spirit, you already have the fullness of the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. You've got more anointing on the your born-again spirit than Elijah, Elisha, Moses, all of these people had. You know, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said that among those who had been born of women, there was none greater than John the Baptist. Then he said, nonetheless, those that are least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. So if John was greater than Moses, Elijah, David, anybody, and if you are the least in the kingdom of heaven, you're greater than Moses, David, Elijah, all of those guys. And people think, well, how can that be? Because you're looking in the flesh, you're looking in your mind and emotions, but in your spirit, you've already got this. God's grace has already provided everything. You don't need more power. You don't need more love. You don't need more faith. You need more knowledge. You need to acknowledge what you already have so that your faith would begin to start working. I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel and the programs that we have available. And I want to encourage you that you can get the materials that we've offered. Also, I'd like to encourage you to like our program and subscribe to what we're doing. We have a lot of material and I believe it'll be a real blessing to you. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you.